It's something that makes you feel good. Now, when you're stressed, your body wants to consume something and to find a little bit of pleasure. When you're upset, when you're hurting, you want something. And these processed foods are designed in the way that they give you this momentary high. I think a lot of people, myself included at many times in my life, are just looking for a quick fix and thinking, if I can just lose weight fast, then that's going to fix everything. And then I'll be able to keep it off. It's uh, very expensive and the, the best thing that I ever did in my life. I'm really happy with it. I think that I could have lived with it. If I thought it was not an option whatsoever, I could have learned to live with it. And I think the biggest mistake I see other people making currently is like we talked about earlier, going down these trends that are just not right for them or that really don't make sense for their lifestyle. Okay, good uh, morning, happy Tuesday. Everybody hope that you guys had a great uh, Memorial Day weekend. We have Laura with us again, Laura Spath with us. Thank you for uh, coming back in. It's always fun to chat with you. I'm, I'm uh, I guess, excited to see what you're up to. So Laura, if you don't mind, just uh, for the people that aren't familiar with, just kind of let them know who you are real quick and then we can start chatting. Yeah, great. My name is Laura Spath. I have been eating a carnivore diet for five and a half years now. I first heard about it in 2018 through going down the rabbit hole from the Joe, heard you on Joe Rogan and went down the rabbit hole. My husband said, wait, I don't have to eat vegetables in order to lose weight and be healthy. And he immediately signed up. I was more reluctant, but once I realized how much better I felt cutting out some of the foods that were causing me issues and vegetables, then it made it a lot easier. And Switching to this full carnivore lifestyle for my husband and I has been really life changing. We have lost a lot of weight. We've finally been able to keep it off, which is, I think, the biggest challenge with weight loss. And it just ends up being just this nice, easy lifestyle that we've settled into that's keeping us really healthy and active. Yeah, it's curious how people are excited when you tell them you don't have to eat vegetables. Said, Why is that? Because we're, we're, most of us have been were badgered into eating them as a kid. I can remember as a kid sitting there staring at a plate of vegetables I, I didn't want for two or three hours and my parents refusing to let up until I ate them. <laughs> I spent many nights at the table for three or four hours, slowly choking those things down. And the last thing you said was curious because I think a lot of people, you generate a lot of attention with this sort of really dramatic before and after picture that you had back five, five years ago or so when you did that. And then I know, I, like I said, you said there's been times where you, you relax, you just have this sort of relapse thing, yep. things go So I'm curious as to, you said you finally figured out how to really keep it off without, so what's going on with that? Where did you uh, figure that out or how did you figure that out? Yeah, I think I lost weight and I had lost weight previously. And I think anybody can be successful losing weight in a variety of ways. But then I lost weight just by following this strict protocol that I thought was the perfect carnivore diet. And then in 2020, all of my routine, this perfect routine that I had created in order to keep the weight off was thrown out the window. No. And that happens a lot with so many people where stressful work situations happen, grief happens, life is going to happen. And we immediately throw out this entire 17 step process that we were following in order to stay healthy. And that was when I really had to start addressing me and my relationship with food. Why was I turning to food in the first place? And why was I choosing to eat? But then also learning what are my boundaries and that's been the biggest thing with me for carnivore and why I've been able to keep it off is I've found boundaries of ways that I feel like I can relax in my mind, things that I give myself a little uh, cheat, but it stays within this boundary of things that I still, it's not carbs, it's not sugar. They're not things that are causing me to um, obsessively eat. And I can still go on vacation and eat what I want. So it's a two-part thing. You have to be able to live your life with whatever way of eating you're doing. And carnivore absolutely allows me to be relaxed or be more strict depending on the setting that I'm in or the goals that I have. But then also there's this deeper aspect where you have to figure out why are you turning to food in the first place? And that's not as fun. <laughs> it's not as fun as like cooking and eating steak. And it's not as simple as it sounds. You have to really address like what are the reasons why you are trying to use that food for an emotional support in the first place. Yeah, any obviously you've got insight into your own sort of reasons, yeah. and from your side of the side of the or your point of view, what was it that was driving you to use food as a crutch as a drug? Yeah, that, I, I exactly view it that way. It's something that makes you feel good. Now, when you're stressed, 
your body wants to consume something and to find a little bit of pleasure when you're upset, when you're hurting, you want something. And these processed foods are designed in the way that they give you this momentary high. It literally gives you the sense of endorphins, this blood sugar spike, you're feeling awesome and amazing. This huge drug rush almost after you consume a lot of these processed foods. And so for one brief moment, it might be, it might feel, you might feel better about whatever it is you're going through. But pretty rapidly, you realize how those foods are affecting you, how they make you feel, the withdrawal from those foods. And it just starts this endless spiral of needing to feed that urge that you have within yourself. And cutting it off completely takes a lot of that away. Yeah. Well, let me, I guess you said there's a strict version and there's a relaxed version yeah. and you know what you consider, what, what the boundary is for a cheat. For me, like dairy is almost like a cheat piece of cheese, yes. which is nice. Like on the spectrum of things, what I would eat before, but like, like a, a box of ice cream sandwiches or something, it's like really, it's minor. And I think my friend Mark Bell said it was really, the nice thing about carnivore is there was, there's no real sort of halfway thing. You either know when you're on and you're off. And so you can have a yeah. very narrow, clear path. And so, whereas you're on a ketogenic diet, you can make some really garbage keto, keto macro wise or right. paleo or whatever, what you, what you want to call it just by excluding certain ingredients. So what do you, what would, I guess, the concept of being more relaxed versus strict, what does that mean to you? There's things that I consider like carnivore junk foods, which are pepperonis, cheese, a lot of cheese sticks, pork rinds, those types of things. Where if I go on vacation, I used to go crazy into carb land and eating all the local foods and eating seven times a day and kind of going, and then you feel miserable the whole time. But for me now, I can go on vacation Honestly, snacking to me is like a cheat. Like having anything outside of my designated two meals a day is a cheat. I'm not doing that on a regular basis. But if I go on vacation, I'll go check out the local meat shop or these grocery stores and find some specialty meats and cheeses, um, maybe some local pork rinds from a restaurant. So those are things that I would incorporate outside of my mealtime that are a little more fun. If I was eating that frequency and that type of food every day, personally, I would gain weight. It would cause me some inflammation, but it's a fun way for me to feel like I'm doing something on a vacation to let me relax a little bit. Yeah, is maybe I just got back from I was in France for a while and then Greece yeah. for a week and on this keto carnivore resort re- retreat. And while I was able to stay pretty much strictly carnivore for the most part, although our hostess and and Roberta is wonderful. She's very gregarious and very wants to make every, everybody has, but she would make these certain like carnivore desserts. I'll call it quote carnivore desserts. And she was like, you got to try it. You please. She just made you good. You had to try. So I I had some of that. I wouldn't normally eat that at all. This is not something I wouldn't certainly want to, I certainly wouldn't want to take the time to make it because it's a lot of, there's a lot of work and or more work than I would normally be willing to do. That's I'll say I'm not a carnivore ice cream or a carnivore bread person only because there and there might be versions I'm with you there's it's a lot of work but also those things just leave me grumpy like it just makes me miss the real thing and I would rather not introduce that replacement in my head at all Uh, I a major cheat for me I posted something that everybody got a little triggered about I took a piece of Costco pizza and a hot dog and I took the actual hot dog and rolled it in the cheese from the pizza and that was I was like hey here's my little cheat day so I would rather take like a bunch of cheese and toppings from a pizza and a little and a hot dog with no bun and that was like a look at how crazy and wild I'm being even though I think sometimes we convince ourselves that things like that I just that pizza the zero carb pizza Versus in the ice creams that, oh, they're carnivore, they're approved. I can have them all the time. But I would, I think most people like myself would gain weight. We would feel terrible. That's not the nutritional positive benefits that you're going to get from being on a carnivore diet. You could still do it in a junky way where you're just getting a lot of these replacement foods. Yeah. And I, it's funny. I was, I'm still catching up from the time zone change. So I'm waking up too early in the morning. So I'm hungry in the morning. Because I'm, I'm up already, w- waiting, and I'll, I'll eat around 11 a.m. or something like that. So, I I, you know, I, I won't blame you, but I, I remember I, I met you at one of the conferences. Maybe it was KetoCon or something like that. We were on a panel together, and you, at the end, you had these little, you made these dried, you know, 
pork, oh, yeah. pork or beef or something like that. And it was really good. So I've got, since that time, I've got a meat slicer and I do that. And I did some, my family wanted some, so I made some, of course. Now I'm like, that stuff is too hard to resist. I mean, it's literally almost like a carnivore crack cocaine or something like that. So I just, I was just munching on that right before we got out of here because I'm, I'm, I didn't have time to eat steaks before this. But that's one of those things where it's, even that, even though it's pure meat mm-hmm. and there's, it's meat and salt, even the snacking on that is unusual for me because, I, like I said, it just drives that sort of unusual behavior. And it's not probably any causing any significant issues. But if you, like you said, if you snacked on, I don't know, muffins and granola bars or something like that, it seems like the ramifications for that last a lot longer. It's like several days people just have cravings and then they go in and it's just like you just justify doing another and then it's then then it goes and goes and so it is makes sense to have like i said everybody goes on vacation we all are not every most people get to go on vacation some people in the world don't even get a vacation there but most people listen to this will know what that is to go on go out of town visit relatives and you are faced with those sort of dilemmas how does i guess i know your husband chris i believe Mm-hmm. rarely appears on videos or I don't th- I think I've seen a picture of I don't know if I've ever I don't think I've ever spoken with him maybe I have I can't remember but how does is he have a similar take to you are you guys pretty locked together on on the same stuff or are you guys each have a little bit different method you know he I have had to adjust a little bit over the years just simply because I can't eat as much in one sitting anymore I used I love eating one big meal a day and just crushing a couple pounds of steak but I just can't do that the same way now that I could when I first was starting out and when I was obese he's still able to do that so he's he lives pretty strictly in this one meal a day and he's like you just crushes a few pounds of steak and that's his one meal every day he trains jiu jitsu So he's like very active and is able to do all of that with still having this like one big meal of steak for us. Again, special occasions, holidays just usually means fancier steak or like crab legs or fancy cheeses with our meal. We really, it's, it's so helpful. And I have so much respect for people who do this when they're the only ones in their house that are doing it. Cause I can't imagine how difficult that would be, but we're the same way. He actually is going out to California to visit with his buddies this weekend. And for him getting, he'll grab some bags of pork rinds and he might actually have a couple low carb alcoholic drinks is the way that he maybe would splurge with some of his friends. And then while they're all munching on pizza at midnight, he'll munch on a bag of pork rinds. And that's his way a couple times a year of doing something that's a splurge, but it's nice that we're both aligned that when we go on vacation, we went to Memphis this summer and we were seeking out like, what are the famous barbecue places that don't use sugar in their rubs? And like, where can we get some interesting meats in this going to still experience? Imagine like when you were in Greece, there's all kinds of like local foods. I'm headed to Madrid uh, next week and I'm researching what is the unique meats and fun things that I can do while I'm there. And it's just a really, he, thankfully he's aligned with me on that as well. Yeah, there's, I think, Madrid, Spain in general, pork, and then some of those things, yeah. hams and porks and stuff like that are going to be quite good. But I think they have good beef as well. I've yet to go, but uh, I've heard from that. And then I can't remember if you guys had kiddos or not. Do you guys have any kids in the house? We do. So how, yeah, do, how do they do it? Uh, they're seven and nine. And there is a lot of freedom in not having to force them to eat vegetables. <laughs> I'm always transparent. Like my kids are not strict carnivore, but they are, we focus on meat and the same thing, not snacking, even though they're kids, they don't need snacks three or four times a day. I get moms reaching out saying, how do you get your kids to eat meat? And it's don't give them carby snacks at two in the afternoon. And by four or five o'clock, they're going to be really hungry for a piece of meat when it comes to dinner. So we focus on three meals a day, protein first, and then if they, my daughter loves a salad, but my son doesn't, and it's freeing to not have to sit there and force a seven-year-old to eat vegetables because I'm confident he's getting all the nutrients he needs from the meat and eggs and, and things that he's eating. But then if they want to have something like that, then they do. They have, we, they have some carbs and sugar or fruit. They'll have breakfast for them is like protein and fruit. We just try to keep it like earlier in the day. So they're not having fruit with their dinner and then trying to go to sleep after just having a bunch of fruit. They both are really active. They both train jujitsu. So any type of sugar or fruits and things like that, that they're having, we just have earlier in the day, but they're uh, both pretty healthy kids. Yeah. I was going to ask you how their health was. And I, I already probably knowing they're doing fine. That's yeah. they're probably better off than 99% of the kids who's who are getting the juice boxes and the granola bars and all the garbage and 
When I was when I was a kid, I remember you'd come home from school and you'd say, Mom, I'm hungry. And she said, dinner's in two hours or right. whatever. It, but today it's, oh, here, go get your granola bar. And, and it, it does. It ruins your appetite for actual real food. And I think that's a real sort of tragedy. I can see in them, though, the instincts of they're bored and they go, they all, they don't eat snacks and they come in and all of a sudden, if they're asking like, oh, can we have a snack? I'm hungry. I want a snack. It's, and you realize for the last hour, they've been like trying to figure out something to do where they're bored, but you can already see those instincts that all of us have of I'm bored. I want to eat. And it, even though it has nothing to do with hunger. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Eating out of boredom is a, I think a pretty common thing because it gives you something to do. And like you yeah. said, you get that little drug-like effect in many ways. What, you, you've been doing this now five plus years. Did did you experiment with something? I know it's popular. A lot of people are introducing, reintroducing. I know uh, there's just people that have gone more animal-based and, and for some people that works for others that don't. Have you been able to play with any of those things or even pretty just, I don't have any interest in that? I would love to have interest in it, but the things that I miss are not things that I could handle moderating, nor are they things that would be healthy for me. So I'm not sitting around lamenting that I don't get to eat broccoli. I'm more thinking about the ice pints of ice cream that I used to eat in the evenings. And I know that's obviously not a world I can go back to. I've had, my daughter loves asparagus, but she doesn't eat the tops. So I've eaten the top of her asparagus a couple of times. Like there, it's not, I don't live in this world where it's, I'm scared to eat a bite of something else, but I do know what my limits are. I know my limits are I cannot eat carbs and sugar because it activates that part of my brain that just wants them endlessly. And I really just know that eating a salad would cause me a lot of digestive issues um, and eating vegetables on a regular basis would bring up a lot of the health issues and skin issues and inflammation and digestive issues that I had previously. So I have settled in this groove of not really stressing about what the rules are around what I'm eating. I've never been somebody who's tracked macros or gone down a lot of the carnivore experiments. Personally, I just know more than anything, if I'm having to force myself to fit a certain macro or a certain eating window and all those things, like I do intermittent fasting, but it all works within my schedule. If I'm forcing myself to eat certain fat ratios or eat super lean or eat crazy high fat, I'm going to lose what's nice about this in its simplicity and its enjoyment and how much I love the food. And that is to me, one small step away from going back to what I was doing before. And I have to be really diligent to ensure that I, I eat amazingly delicious food every day. And that's a huge part of the reason why I'm able to maintain this and be successful is, and then it works within my lifestyle. And so I just, I'm very careful not to go down a lot of the carnivore trend rabbit holes and just keep it pretty normal. And then I know the other foods that I can't introduce that I couldn't really handle. Yeah, I, I jokingly made a little post on Twitter or X, as it's called now, about yeah. these things that are trends. And you see these sardine fasts and egg fasts yeah. and gulping down testicles and all the stuff that people have done over the years, which make me chuckle. And I think the basics are just eating hamburger, beef, and seafood, maybe a little dairy, something like that. And that generally is all you really need to do. And some people try to get... I don't know, maybe there's more or one attention or it's some that you can't tell the social media stuff. It's just what gets more attention. Um, and I think it starts off sometimes those trends start off with really good intentions and maybe they're designed for a very specific reason. But like you said, the social media virality of the internet and it, everything turns into a trend. And then I think a lot of people, myself included at many times in my life are just looking for a quick fix and thinking if I can just lose weight fast, then that's going to fix everything. And then I'll be able to keep it off. When in reality, I've lost weight, even with carnivore doing it in a way that wasn't sustainable for me long-term and you just can't keep it off. So I am hundred percent focused on like consistency is better than perfection. And you just have to figure out how are you going to be able to stick to this long-term and not worry about what's the fastest way that I can see a result based on the trend that somebody is promising me from the internet. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. And what over the last because you had your initial transformation, which took, I don't know, six months or so. I can't yep. remember how long it was. And then you, where have you gone from there? Have you found that yeah. you, you've even gotten better, stronger, leaner, more healthy? What has been the progress over the last four years since that time? Yeah. So the first, in about six months, I lost a hundred pounds and it was like 120 in that first 10 months. 
doing it really in this, like the only priority I had in my life at the time was losing weight. And just, that was my number one focus. And then, like I said, 2020, I gained a decent amount of weight back and then have slowly, I lost it after that in the beginning of 2021. And really the last, my proudest moment in all of this is the fact that I have been at pretty much the same weight for the last three and a half years, which is like the first time in my life that's happened. Introducing things like exercise and being consistent with that has been harder for me. I am a true believer in you have to take things one day at a time. And to be honest, like it took me a long enough time just to figure out how to get my food dialed in. So that wasn't something that was like a mental struggle with me every day. But now I am focusing most on building muscle, be trying to be leaner. I did have, and I try to be very transparent about this. I did, after I lost my weight and had maintained it for several years, I had some skin removal surgery, but now I'm focusing the most on building muscle and finding out like, it's really hard to tell yourself like I'm to change the mindset of, I want to be as thin as possible to, I want to be as healthy as possible and as strong as possible. And that's really been my shift um, this year so far is I've been consistent at the gym for probably the first time in my life without going to this extreme, right. Finding the balance of working out a few times a week, trying to build muscle and then eat enough to be able to maintain that muscle as well and grow muscles. Yeah. The nice thing about training and trying to put on muscles, you, you get to eat a little more. So if you like that, I'd rather eat more and work out more than, than eat less. And that's just me. I've always been a guy that likes to eat. And so I can still easily put down three, four, five, six pounds of meat a day if, 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 if I want to. So it's not hard at all for me to do that. So I'm using- For someone who's focused on weight loss though, and been scared of regaining weight for the majority of my life, when you start exercising a lot and you're trying to build muscle, the scale is going to play around a little bit and it's really hard to break that mindset. So that's really been my biggest focus in more recent years is I feel like I've mastered the keeping it off part. And so now I'm focusing on not letting building the muscle and not worrying about what the scale does in the meantime. Yeah, I guess, you know, and and I think there's a lot of people that find different success with different strategies with even within a carnivore diet i mean to a degree there's a a little bit of a dichotomy of people that are more protein centric and there's people that are certainly more fat centric and i think there's reasons for both i tend to be more kind of protein uh centric i suppose i still consume i'm on a high fat diet and i consume plenty of fat but i'm not to the point where i'm eating a lot of added fat where some people are tallows and butter and all, you know, fat, fat all the time. Where do you fall on that? Or is it, has that changed over time? It really hasn't. It's been pretty similar. I, I haven't really ever tracked it consistently or forced a certain metric. I often plug it into a tracker just because I get asked and want to share examples of meals and what that looks like with people. I really ensure that I'm getting like at least 120 to 140 grams of protein in a day. I did go through a little bit when I had first started keto and then that turned into carnivore. I personally was so concerned at the time. This was in early 2018 when keto was the big rage. I was so concerned about having the keto macros of really high fat and low protein. I was eating like 50, 60 grams of protein a day back then. And all my hair started falling out. And a lot of that came with rapid weight loss. So rapid weight loss and under eating protein, in my opinion, was what caused a lot of the hair loss. And so Once I realized that the last four and a half years, my biggest focus has been on getting enough protein. And then I like eat a little more fat or a little less fat based on how I'm feeling. If I've been a little drained that day, I'll add some butter to my steak. And if I'm trying to lose a little more weight, I just won't put the butter on or I'll not eat the cheese that day. So I'll make small tweaks like that, but protein is my biggest focus. And then if I plugged it into a tracker, I might have anywhere between 60, 65, 75% fat to protein per day. But I also think our bodies need very different things on different days. And it seems unnatural for me to see people hitting these specific macros. Like I need this ratio every day, all the time. When I know my hunger level and my protein needs change if I'm lifting weights that day versus if I'm having a rest day. So I don't understand why we would look to hit specific macros every day versus trying to just make slight adjustments based on what our body needs. But I think so many women, especially as we age, are under eating protein. I see that every day. Yeah, I would concur. I think that's we've got such a issue with obesity in this country that we forget about 
the other side of the coin, which would be frailty. And frailty is everybody, I wouldn't say every bit, but it's certainly a a major issue. And uh, certainly as you get older, you don't want to be the, you don't want to be the person that struggles to carry their suitcase from the car to the, the hotel room or something like that. That's a real sort of sore place to be. Um, what about, so you're, I, mean, I don't know how, I can't remember how old you guys are, but I, I assume you're maybe, I can't remember. I don't want to guess. I'm going to get in trouble and guess. I'm 38, 38. And Chris is 10 years older than me. So he's Okay. 40. So you guys are thirties and forties. And this is it's like I said, I'm, 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 you know, you know, about two decades ahead of you, but what about concerns around saturated fat and heart disease and all that stuff? Is that does that bother you at all? Do you think about that in your back, your mind, or your, or your husband? Does it because even today, and a lot of people just say it doesn't matter. It's not. It, I'm not worried about it at all. But do you think about that stuff at all? Only to that, I feel confident in where I'm at now. And I think that. That's one of the first questions people ask is what about your heart or what about heart disease or what about your cholesterol? But, and I think it's hard for them to hear the answer of I'm excited about my cholesterol. When I was 263 pounds and obese, my cholesterol was 107 total cholesterol. And my doctor was really thrilled about that. And you can just take one look at any picture of me and you realize that I was not healthy. And so now understanding it, it does take a lot of research, I think on your part or the, the individual's part to understand th- things like cholesterol and, and red meat is not causing heart disease. And I, I know you talk often, but like any studies that have been done on the dangers of red meat are done when someone is eating red meat and carbs and sugar and the bun and the fries and the oils and all that kind of stuff on top of it. I try to explain it to my family members in a way of I'm eating a lot of fat, but my body is using that fat for fuel. And so I'm utilizing everything versus if you are eating, the, to me, the worst thing you can do is eat carnivore and then cheat often with carbs and sugar. And that's what scares me a lot about the carnivore plus all the fruit stuff, which is another subject. But when you're eating carbs and you're eating all this red meat, then your body is utilizing all of these carbs for your energy and for your fuel. And then you're storing more of the fat. And maybe that's an, you can clarify if I got anything wrong there, but that's how I explain it to my family members to say, I'm confident that the fat that I'm eating is being utilized for the energy that I'm burning and I'm not actually storing it. And I've done blood work and scans and things like that to verify that's all accurate. So I'm confident in my own health for that reason. Yeah. Energy is going to be utilized, whether it's carbs or fat and your body composition is just a pretty, pretty consistent way to see that. If you're putting on weight, then yeah. you're storing energy and it doesn't matter where it's coming from. In my view, you, I, I can't, I know you work. I can't remember what you're, yeah. I, I know you work a full-time job. I assume maybe you're still doing that. And are you, how much of your life is now dedicated to so, carnivore stuff, social media stuff, or is that us? You're doing appearances now. So I must be yeah. still doing some of that, but what have you been up to with regard to that versus regular work? Sometimes it feels like I work two jobs, but my main job is I like just work a full-time corporate job. I'm like a trainer. Like I do training, leadership development trainings and sales trainings for companies. And that actually has me traveling quite a bit. That's why I'm going to to Spain in a couple of weeks or travel around different places in the U.S. I like making YouTube videos. It's just been something that I had started originally just to try to like shorthand tell people what I did and share our story. And now it's turned into a fun hobby slash almost second job, it feels like sometimes, but it allows, Chris is a stay-at-home dad and homeschools our kids and just allows us the the lifestyle that we want of just having everybody home all the time. It's nice that I get to work from home if I'm not traveling. Really, the social media stuff is really just fun slash I get to put out some YouTube videos and share a little bit about how our family eats this way and hopefully give people some ideas about what we do. But yeah, that's all. I work a normal job and I have no plans of changing that. Yeah, because your kids, I remember you said seven and I can remember the other age, we said yeah. seven and nine. So you've been doing this for five years. So your oldest may somewhat remember you when you were heavier and, and whatnot. But when you were a kid growing up, when did you develop issues with food and being overweight? Was it something as a young child or is it later in life? And then I guess the question with that, the follow-up question to that is when you think about how you raise your own kids now and the fact mm-hmm. that you've become the example to them. But what was it? What, what was your childhood like or, or 
when did you develop the sort of eating issue? Yeah, I grew up in very rural Indiana. We ate a lot of the meat that we ate was deer that my dad hunted and killed. And we had a huge garden and grew our own vegetables and would have a little vegetable stand on the side of the road. My mom made homemade bread every day of my childhood. And that was just, we ate whole foods and we might, my dad was a pastor. So somebody would donate a half of a pig or a half of a cow to our family uh, and we would eat that kind of meat. So it wasn't low carb by any means, but it was all homemade food and potatoes that we grew in our garden and things like that. After my brother passed away when I was 11 and my mom gained a hundred pounds in, in a year. And I think that th- for all of us, I was 11 and getting ready to go through puberty, not to be too emotional, but like then when I was 15, my parents got divorced. And a lot of that was me using food to, at this pivotal moment of me, developing using food for um, pleasure. And when my parents got divorced, we switched from all of this whole foods to I was the one cooking dinner and I was making craft macaroni and cheese and I was making rice aronis. I was cooking out of a box because my mom had to have a job for the first time. And it was a switch to processed foods. I then went to college and moved across the street from Taco Bell. <laughs> there, there goes the rest of my life where breakfast was from a gas station and I ate Taco Bell every day. And it was this really dramatic switch to food for pleasure and entertainment and stress and processed foods was the really big switch that happened there. But like when I was growing up, we never ate in a restaurant. Like I never had sodas or I never had my desserts, like things like that. It just wasn't an issue. So when we look at my kids, I, we try to focus so much because obviously this is a huge topic and they've been raised in this environment where Mom and dad, it could have been portrayed to them that mom and dad are on a diet. And that's just the last thing that I want them to be thinking about is weight and diets and restrictions. We focus a lot with the kids on mom and dad ate so much sugar before that it made us really sick. They know Chris was previously severely diabetic. It it landed him in the hospital. He almost died from his diabetes and now he's not. And it's because we ate so much sugar. That's why we were really sick. And We try to focus with them the most. I don't know what the right answer is. And I think every parent who's raising kids is just trying to do what's best. We don't keep them 100% strict simply for the reasons of I was raised really strict with no processed foods. And then I went to college and this drug hit my brain and I just went crazy having access to that. And so we try to talk about if they go to a birthday party, they're going to eat the food that's there. But we talk about, hey, remember yesterday we had this food at a party. Let's take a break for a couple of days so we don't have too much sugar. Or remember how that made you feel. Remember how we all got cranky in the afternoon, like that type of thing. That's my biggest focus. I'm hoping to raise them with a better moderation mindset than what I have, not to feel like they can't have certain bad foods, but it's the those foods are not going to make you feel good if you eat them very often. Versus we need protein to be strong. We focus on protein first. Hey, what's your, what protein do you want for the, for lunch is the question that we ask when we're throwing food on the grill is like, what do you want for your protein? And really try to just, hopefully I'm raising them in the mindset of that. And I don't know, other people choose to be more strict and and I don't know what the right answer is, but I just know that strict mentality maybe led to a little bit of my overconsumption in later in life. And I hope that they now can realize how different foods make them feel. Yeah. It's you think about it. Mo- most kids don't start out snorting cocaine. Yeah. Most of them get through most of their life without it. And then at some point they have the first time they do that. And and then it becomes this for some and, and uh, just an out of control spiral. And I think the same can be said of the food, because even if you raise these kids up super strict and are never exposed to processed yeah. food and everything's homemade, they'll get out in the real world and, that stuff's there and they're going to try it probably. And then it can have a drug-like effect. So, oh my God, this is so good. And I just, and I'm, I'm, I feel giddy because it, it's like they can eat whatever they want and mom's not there yelling at them to stop eating garbage. And right. <clears throat> so I think maybe just explaining to them, hey, this is the effect. I, again, I don't know the right answer for sure, but I, I suspect it's something like that. Understanding, if they have an understanding that food has an impact on their yeah. cognition, on the, their mood, their their overall health. And then, then they can maybe make that decision because you can't hold their hands forever. And, and at some point they got to, they got to stand up on their own two feet and figure out the right thing. What has been, you said you had, this is because you'd lost a lot of weight and and I see a lot of people. The the nice thing is I've seen, I cannot tell you how many people that are like morbidly obese people, like 400, 500 pounders. 
that are now on carnivore and they're losing weight and they're having success and they're dropping a hundred pounds in a year or even a hundred pounds in six months, like kind of you did. And you're ended up with, you've got this loose skin. I don't, I don't think there's, I, I hear people, if I fast long enough, autophagy is going to take care of it, but that's realistically not the reality. I think for many, particularly these people that are coming from super morbid obese, they're going to have issues with that. And talk with your decision to, to go that route, to, to have it surgically excised, which I think is fine. Gosh, you might, cause I know I, I could imagine it could still be a psychological thing for you. So what was the decision? How did it go? Were you happy with the result? Yeah, it's uh, very expensive and the, the best thing that I ever did in my life. I'm really happy with it. I think that I could have lived with it. If I thought it was not an option whatsoever, I could have learned to live with it. But I felt personally, I have worked so hard and especially then proving to myself that I could keep it off for so long that when you get dressed every day, it's a mental tax to try to find clothes that would fit around the skin in order to make you feel comfortable. And if I'm not trying to walk around in a bikini, but I want to wear shorts and a t-shirt and feel comfortable in the clothes that I'm wearing and not have to worry about the skin and what size my pants are versus what size my shirt are and like having things be comfortable. And I think that's the biggest thing is I was just ready for my body to reflect the work that I had done. And that was really the push for me. I have other areas. I still have loose skin on my arms. The doctor had told me like, let's take up your back as well. Okay. Like I'm not concerned about everything being, I'm not trying to do competitions anywhere. I just knew that like the skin on my stomach was the biggest piece that was preventing me from feeling comfortable in just day-to-day clothes that I would like to have removed. And now this is my biggest motivation now to hit the gym where I have other areas I would like to target and tone where I feel like something can be done, but you're right. And I think there is a misconception saying fasting and autophagy, like the skin that I had and that a lot of people have is not going anywhere. And just because there is someone that shared that their skin went away for whatever reason and whatever protocol they followed, that's not true for the majority of people. And the main reason is just a lot of it's going to be genetics. And yes, I'll say this. When I went to my consultation, the doctors instantly knew by looking at me and the health of my skin and my body that I did not have a gastric bypass to lose weight because the nutri- nutri- uh, nutrients in my skin, the nutritional health of my skin, when your body is depleted and you are losing weight through restriction of nutrients, whether that be through, I think there are people who been successful in staying healthy after having some type of gastric bypass because they're focusing on protein, but whether it's the new drugs that are out there for weight loss, or whether it's just, if you're losing weight in a way that's starving your body of nutrients, your skin will reflect that. And the doctors knew that wasn't the case and that I still maintain healthy skin elasticity. And it had been years. It wasn't going anywhere. I even too previously had gotten thinner than I was in an effort to lose some of that loose skin and it just wasn't going anywhere. And I was pushing myself to that, trying to be too thin in order to lose the skin. And it just wasn't a healthy place for me, energy wise and hormones. And I, as a side note, I think I contribute that a lot to the the weight gain that I had because my body was just really depleted from nutrients because I was trying so hard to lose enough weight that the skin would go away. And I would rather be healthy and have skin removal surgery than try to force myself to over fast or over restrict in order to hope that someday, maybe 10 years from now, it goes away. Like I, th- I don't want to wait that long. So that was, it was an easy decision once I found the right doctor and I'm really thrilled. Yeah. And how was your, how was your healing? Was it uneventful? I, my, yeah. my assumption, because I know good nutrition is going to have a big, good impact on, on that. And so- yeah, really easy. I made sure when I got IVs from the doctor that there wasn't going to be sugar in the IVs. That was the one thing that I called ahead. I took a bunch of the bags of carnivore snacks, the chicken sliders, and because they were like a little cracker. So when I knew I was going to be nauseous after surgery and I was just focusing on eating protein so that I wasn't going to be stuck reaching for crackers or for carbs, but my recovery, like the incisions healing very quick, low inflammation, it's been nine months now and I'm feeling totally normal. I'm doing crazy. I went actually like my husband and I took a three-day trip to Maui eight weeks after I had my surgery. And so that I was feeling totally fine by then. I actually went to the low carb Boca conference about exactly six weeks after my surgery and was maybe hobbling around there a little bit. I had sat on a little pillow just to help me, but was traveling all over the country six weeks after surgery. 
Yeah, good for you. And where I can't, where, Laura, where do you guys live at again? I can't remember. In Arizona. In Arizona. Yeah, I thought Arizona. I was yeah. thinking that. Okay. What is you've obviously five five years into this? Have you found that you made mistakes along the way? And if so, what were they? And I'm, I'm, maybe you haven't. I don't know. I think any mistakes was just thinking that like back in 2020, thinking I could moderate other foods. I think we all have to, we all convince ourselves that, look, I lost the weight. I'm doing good. Now I can go back to eating some other foods that I used to. And this whole, like the lie we tell ourselves about what we can tolerate. And it's a lie. We can't, a lot of us can't. And I think now I'm confident in saying, yeah, if I wanted to eat a vegetable, I could, and I'm not scared of that. I'm not scared that the one bite of a vegetable is killing me, but I just know that I feel better without it. So the mistakes that I think I've made was just thinking I could reintroduce things. And I think the biggest mistake I see other people making currently is like we talked about earlier, going down these trends that are just not right for them or that really don't make sense for their lifestyle, but they think that it's going to give them a quick result. So getting in a hurry is really usually, unfortunately, a sidestep to taking many steps back. And I just encourage people not to try, try to focus on consistency and what works in your life. but. That's usually my lessons learned. Yeah, I don't, I don't think there's many people out there that are going to be binging on asparagus heads or other vegetables. Right. I mean, it's kind of like I've got like literally zero desire to eat any of those. And it's funny with my kids, same thing. I just we go to the store, I, we pick out all this stuff. I my my oldest daughter is in track. I say, hey, focus on getting about a gram per pound of body weight of protein. And so she has to go through and select items that have enough protein in there. And she really doesn't know how to do it because it's. My daughter's about 130 pounds, and so it's a decent amount of protein for a 14-year-old, 15-year-old girl, yeah. and they often don't eat eat that much. And it's very easy to get the particularly carbohydrate macronutrients <laughs> quite easily. What, I know you work with, I think, Judy. Weren't you working with Judy Cho quite a bit in some extent? How is that going? I, I, Judy's done some great work, and I know I was... She interviewed me for a couple of these. I, th- I think she had a little conference or something, yeah. but are you guys still working together and doing stuff? Yeah. So she has a book that's coming out in December. It's the beginner's guide to carnivore. And it really walks through a lot of like how to start with an elimination diet and then reintroducing some things if necessary. But it's like she, her other book is carnivore cure, which is the more advanced scientific really breaks things down at a a deeper level. And so this is a much more basic, like you could hand this to somebody who never heard of carnivore before, and it would help them to get started. And I did some recipes for that book, like just very basic. They're not, when she first asked, I was like, I don't really have recipes. I don't have the carnivore tortillas and the carnivore bread recipes. I just cook meat in an air fryer, cook meat on a grill. And here's how I do that. And I think that hopefully is still helpful for people. I think when people first come to carnivore, just a lot of women, again, I say this, women, especially sometimes don't know how to cook meat. I was a baker. I made casseroles. I didn't know how to cook a simple piece of meat, let alone grill. We had been carnivore for six months. My husband went out of town. I thought I was going to starve because I didn't know how to grill anything. And I got spoiled by grilled steaks every day. So I had to figure that out. And so the recipes that are included in that book are more basic. Like here's how you could feed your family with a piece of meat. And here's the technique on how to do that potentially, whether it's in your air fryer or on the stove or on a grill. But Judy and I, she wrote this brilliant book that's coming out in December. And then I was able to contribute some recipes. And then we have a the Cutting Against the Grain podcast that we do. We're taking a, a we've both been really busy with some things. We're taking a little break of recording it, but there's a, a ton of uh, great episodes in an archive that all still are relevant now. Let me ask you, because I, I, I can't remember, I think I know the answer to this, but only grass-fed, eating organs, things like that. Are you opinion on either of those? Do you, do you, what do you do typically? I think that how people first find out about carnivore is so indicative of the rabbit, of how they get started and what they think. And I, Chris and I say, I think thankful every day that we found you first. And it was a very normal approach of just eat the meat from the grocery store. I get most of my meat from Costco, from the regular grocery store that's on sale. Walmart actually has fantastic beef and really great pork. So those are things that we eat and I have not ever done the raw liver. We don't eat organs at all. And I haven't ever, actually, I'm trying to like never once in five and a half years have I eaten organs um, or worried about all of that. So I'm grateful that we found out about this like this normal way from the very beginning, because those aren't things that in the beginning, there's a long time. I could never have afforded to eat that way. I could never have afforded all the grass finished meats and, and let alone don't prefer the taste of it. And so I'm glad that 
we do this pretty affordably. Our grocery budget is way less now than it was before because we've cut out all of the junk food and desserts that we used to eat previously. Yeah, the only downside is you're not radical enough or you're subprimal or something like that. <laughs> I don't have any videos that say these seven foods are killing you like that. I'm not viral enough because yeah, I don't yeah, tell you yeah. the eggs you're eating are killing you yeah, yeah. with a shocking thumbnail. Yeah, no, I get it. Yeah, it's it's goofy where we got to. And it's, it's like I said, when I came to this, like I said, I will take credit for naming it carnivore because I was a guy that called it carnivore. Before that, it was zero car or something similar. And those people, the Kelly Hogan's and the Charles Washington's and the Amber O'Hearn's and the Charlene and, and Joe Anderson's that have been doing this in a, a decade in advance of me even knowing about this stuff. They were like, look, you don't need to eat organs and you don't need to eat raw and you don't need to eat grass finish. And that's what we've discovered as a community that's been doing this for a decade more. And then new people got involved and they're like, well, I looked at the research and I looked at the science, and, or maybe I want to make money on supplements. I'll, I'll be a little. Yeah. I do think a lot of the trends and like you said earlier, like things get that way because everybody is trying to find their own niche on the internet and get the views and get the subscribers and the people that join all their, buy their protocols and, and supplements and things. That's, but I think hopefully people see through a lot of that and are able just to be normal about it. That's my biggest goal. Put some, if you don't have autoimmune issues and you're not struggling with that, put some spices on your meat. Then it tastes good. Like I love a little Parmesan cheese on some chicken wings or on a pork chop or something like that. Enjoy some spices in a way that makes it taste good. And, and as long as it doesn't affect you negatively. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. And it's, it's, I've been fairly consistent since I started and I don't, Nothing has compelled me to change that at this point. And yeah. not that I never would, but it's so far. And, I, and I've never been particularly dogmatic about it. I'm like, hey, if it works for you, good for you type of thing. And yeah. we're, I think, still still seeing good results. And you certainly have had to have seen a, a growing acceptance to this. I guess people are begrudgingly accepting that it's a thing. <laughs> I think that's the first thing. Now, many people are still making fun of it and criticizing it, but it's clearly becoming a, a realistic part of the, the food nutrition landscape. And have you seen a general, like I said, I have a perception because I see a lot of stuff on social media, but what has been your perception with the the perception of carnivore in, in the last few years? Have you seen it evolve? Yeah, I spend the majority of my time I spend in the real world with like normal people. And it is interesting, like just in the corporate world or through our church groups and these people at jujitsu, I don't spend my time really around a lot of carnivores other than a couple of friends who I've converted along the way. And it, the just the awareness of it, when you say I'm on a carnivore diet or if you order a certain way in a restaurant, your coworkers are like, oh, you do like low carb or keto. And I'm like, yeah, something like that. And they're like, what is it? And I'm like, it's like a, technically it's a carnivore diet. And they're like, oh yeah, my buddy, or I did this, or sometimes, oh, my boyfriend does this. I like was in at a meeting in Calgary and was just eating a bag of dried meat for my lunch while everybody else had sandwiches. And this uh, girl came over, do you do carnivore? And uh, she's my, my fiance started doing that. So just the number of people who already know about it or particularly know me from somehow through this or something is really grown a lot. That's been a very interesting thing to see over the last several years. And I just see like in my own community, a ripple effect of one person at the church is started doing it. She leads worship and she's lost 75 pounds and she's healing her Hashimoto's. And then the next thing there's eight people that are all doing it at the same time. So with the results that people are seeing, I think the impact that people are having and spreading awareness of it is less through some of the viral social media stuff. Because to be honest, I think sometimes that just makes people dismiss it when they're seeing people eating sticks of butter and slurping down raw liver. I think it takes away its credibility. But when you see the impact that it's having on people in your real world, and that I think is spreading massively because people are saying, I know somebody or I've heard of somebody or all these people that they know are actually doing it. And I think that's where it truly is growing rapidly. Yeah. Yeah. I don't disagree with that. Laura, we're getting close to end of time. I got to jump on and do a couple of consultations here in a minute. And so remind folks your YouTube channel, any social media or anything else you want to share before we go. Yeah. You can just look me up on YouTube for uh, Laura Spath and on Instagram, it's uh, Laura E. Spath. And then if you really want, I do live streams uh, weekly. I have a little community where I post some extra stuff and give them access to early videos. And, and that's where I really, I don't do coaching or consultations, but we all try to just encourage each other and help each other. If that's at uh, lauraespath.locals.com. 
All right, Laura, it's great uh, seeing you're still doing well, and I, I suspect yeah. that'll be the case for quite some time to come. Appreciate what you do, and thanks for being here. And for the rest of the folks, uh, we'll be back tomorrow with another. I think we have an open meeting tomorrow. There's no guests tomorrow, so I think it's Wednesday. All right, thanks, everybody. Thanks, Laura. You have a great one. Say hi to Chris Thank for you. me, and take care of your kiddos, and have a good uh, trip to Spain, by the way. I'll Thank you so much. Good. I'll be interested yeah. to see if you what you find there, because I'd, I'd like to go there at some point and check it out. So anyway. Cool. All right, bye, guys.